Number 10, getting his memories back. I mean, this is one of the worst and best things to happen to Bucky when you think about it. He pursued his memories for a long time after losing them to brainwashing, but at the same time, they gave him a pretty huge amount of guilt, as he also remembered everything he had done. The person he used to be, but also the person he was shaped into becoming, against his will. It would often mean that we'd get a very different version of Bucky when he returned as the Winter Soldier, after he remembered who he was. A much moodier version than the bright eyed youngster who had been Captain America's confidant, pal, and sidekick. It would also mean that Bucky would often feel he wasn't worthy of certain tasks, titles, or even friendships, and that it would be hard for him to move forward and see himself as the hero that he could be. The hero he always had been before he was manipulated into being a villain that really he was not. Number 9. Died in the snap. Oh, I didn't snap. Can't snap today. This is terrible. Ah, oh, don't give me the gauntlet today. Admittedly, not that bad, as all the heroes who died were returned to us once more when the Avengers finally managed to discover the secrets of time travel, used it to collect the stones, and managed to reassemble a version of the gauntlet, and undid what Thanos had done. But still. Dying is never really a good time, I imagine, and all the death we experienced in Infinity War was still very tragic. Also for a while, we didn't really know if it would end up being reversed. I mean, we hoped, we guessed, we assumed, but it was still unknown as to if it would end up being possible for our heroes to bring everyone back. So of course, Bucky is now back, and after Steve traveled back in time to settle down with Peggy, live his life out with her, and basically ended up retiring, the Winter Soldier returns to the screen to team up on Disney Plus with his partner and Cap's friend besides Falcon, aka Sam Wilson. Alright friends, before we move on to this next point, if you are enjoying this video and you want to see more videos like it and hear more cool stuff about Winter Soldier, be sure to show us you like it by giving it a thumbs up. Hey! Number 8. The Death of His Parents Not only does Bucky have a tragic life following the events of World War II, but even before then, it was pretty sad. When he was only 10 years old, he found himself an orphan. His mother had died earlier on when he was younger, making Bucky not just an older brother to his sister, but also kind of a stand-in parent for her as well, with his father working working most of the time to provide for the family. Later on, Bucky would lose his father too, who died in a tragic accident that took place during his basic training with the military. Bucky and his sister would ultimately be split up, and Bucky would end up convincing Camp Lehigh, where his dad had trained, to take him in as a ward of the state, with him going on to become the camp mascot, inspiring and later on even assisting the troops. Number 7. A Man Out of Time Like Captain America, Bucky is also considered a man out of time. While he was born in 1925, he now lives in the present day, meaning that many of his friends from his days when he was a camp mascot during the war times and pal of Captain America, or if we're talking the MCU serving in the war, are now all dead. Not only that, but like Steve, he's had to adapt to the progress of the modern day, adapting to living in a very different world from the one that he was born into. Granted, this may have been easier for Bucky considering he was at least around at least periodically throughout the passing years and as such has at least seen some of the changes as they've happened. But of course this timelessness could also be hard for him to adjust to, especially considering how much of the time in his life he spent being controlled by others and not really experiencing the world from his own point of view, but being manipulated by others to see it how they wanted him to see it. Number 6 Lost a fight to Ant-Man It was a great audition, but it will never happen again. Those are the words Sam Wilson says to Scott Lang when they meet for the second time in Captain America Civil War. The first time they met was when Scott was sent to the new Avengers facility by Hank Pym in the first Ant-Man movie. See, Scott wasn't aware that he was going there, but once he arrived, Sam Wilson was sure aware of his presence. Falcon demanded to know why he was there, and when Ant-Man said he needed to borrow the signal decoy, Falcon just wasn't buying it, and they went at it. And at one point, Sam pulled out guns and shot at Scott. That's how much he thought he was a spy, but Scott won, not by using the higher ground, but by using the smaller one. He shrunk down and got into Sam's jetpack, pulled some plugs, and then Sam fell down to the ground, letting the new Avenger finish his mission. So Sam called into Natasha and made it very clear that Steve never hears about this in the future. Don't worry, Sam, I think all is forgiven at this point. Number five, arrested. Captain America's Civil War is a staple in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The story that begins to unfold in that movie is still being worked out today in the MCU with Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So when Sam Wilson tried to help Steve protect Bucky from Black Panther, it ends with them being arrested. And on top of being arrested, Cap got his shield taken away and Sam's wings were also taken. So when Zemo sneaks into the compound disguised as a psychologist, the power goes out and Sam is left to face off against the Winter Soldier without any of his gear. 
And it doesn't last too long. In fact, none of the Avengers last too long, but Steve was thankfully able to stop him. The whole Sokovia Accords thing made it very hard for them to suit up and start blowing up the whole building. Now, without his wings, the Falcon couldn't fly and would have to catch a super soldier on feet, regular human feet. Odds are you're not gonna succeed. He's actually quite great at being a sleeper agent. And he didn't succeed. Nice try, Sam. Your heart's in the right place, at least, so that's cool. Number four, Marvel Zombies. In Marvel Zombies 3, issue two, we see Falcon and well, he's not around for too long, thankfully. I know this sounds weird, but hear me out. So Earth 2149 is a universe I hope to never see with my own eyes because it's terrifying. All of our heroes are zombified, they're zombies. It's gory, it's hopeless, and we're actually gonna get some sort of zombie episode for Disney's What If series coming to Disney Plus. So maybe we'll see this horrible version of Falcon, but hopefully not, because, ooh. So Sam received a call from Nick Fury about this terrible world issue. And at this point, heroes and villains have put their past aside because now it's go time. He doesn't last long in human form because when Beast and Reed Richards find a large stash of meat in Latveria, a zombie falcon swoops in with a horde of other zombies. So zombie falcon returned to New York and then when Machine Man and Jocasta arrived, all these flying zombie supers attacked. Falcon, of course, being one of them. Now alongside him, we also have Beak, Angel, and Vulture. Falcon got a hold of Jocasta's leg, robot leg, I might add, and she got payback by blasting his head off with her laser eyes. So not Sam's finest hour, that's for sure. Number three, Chased War Machine. One of the biggest holy sh moments from Captain America's Civil War was when Rhodey went down at the end of the airport battle. This was a moment where the audience wasn't actually sure if he had survived or not. And to this day, he's still working out his paralysis. So what happened again? Well, while Ant-Man, well rather Giant Man, distracted the rest of the gang, Captain America and Bucky Barnes had made it to the Quinjet while War Machine and Iron Man were flying behind them, trying to get them to stop. So Falcon flew in to help Cap and Buck by launching missiles to distract War Machine. And when Vision shot a laser beam out of the Mind Stone, Falcon quickly reacted by tucking in his wings and free falling out of the way, but that laser had to go somewhere and it went right through Rhodey's arc reactor. So Sam and Tony flew down as fast as they could to try and catch him, but it was no hope as Rhodey slammed into the ground. Falcon begins to apologize to Tony, but Tony doesn't say a word. He instead hits Sam with a repulsor shot. And the next we see of Sam is when he's locked up with the rest of the Avengers who chose the wrong side on the raft. Sad times. Number two. He quit being Captain America. So back in 2015, Captain America was Sam Wilson. It was a good time, mostly. See, Steve had given him the shield, and then in the second issue of Captain America, Sam Wilson, Sam got into it with shield over some leaked information that had shield creating its own version of the cosmic cube. So Sam wasn't on board with this, so he quit working for the government, and he pulled back to just instead being a friendly neighborhood Captain America. Then shield went ahead and made this new cosmic cube, Kobik, which actually made Steve Rogers young again Again, and his superpowers were topped off as well. So they both were working as Captain America. Now we have two. Two is better than one. Isn't this glorious? This is so good. Which was great for a while, but come issue 21, the world had viewed Sam in a negative way, so he quit. He was like, yeah, f you guys, I'm out of here. He quit until the Secret Empire storyline concluded. You know, with the real Steve Rogers coming back from the cube after he defeated his evil self, all that jazz. But even afterwards, he returned the shield yet again to let Steve inspire the world himself, which is super similar to what I think is currently happening in the MCU with Falcon and the Winter Soldier, because at the end of episode one, we meet number one, the replacement. At the end of Falcon and the Winter Soldier episode one, right before the credits, we see a pretty shocking announcement. We see the government announce a new symbol of hope, a new Captain America. And there he is, wearing the same suit, rocking the same shield, not Falcon. But instead, a new guy, this guy named US Agent. Wyatt Russell is playing this character in the MCU. His name is John Walker, and the character first came into comics with Captain America issue 323. He actually started off opposed to Captain America. He was one of those guys who like stage fights, made himself look better, and then he took on the alias Super Patriot, and then finally, he went to the new Captain America. This guy isn't the most gentle in the comics, so it may seem like a good choice for the government and how the current state of the world post blip is, it might get quite ugly. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have the Power Broker. John Walker looked up to his older brother Michael quite a bit, especially after he sacrificed his life serving during the Vietnam War. So John decided to follow in his brother's footsteps and he went into the military service as well. 
but that still wasn't enough. John felt like he still wasn't the hero that he needed to be. He kept comparing himself to Michael, and what exactly is a hero without a few super abilities on the side, am I right? So he paid a visit to the power broker. The power broker is being teased throughout Falcon and Winter Soldier right now, but what do they do? Who are they? Well, they trade their knowledge of technology for high paying customers who want to undergo this risky process to basically become a superhero. It's like a gamble to get some powers. Half the time, the clients wouldn't even survive. See, it's not that easy to become a superhero, but it worked for John Walker. Unfortunately, it enhanced his strength a hefty amount. So now we have the motivation, we have the superpowers, so what's the next step? And before we continue on with this list, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be great. You guys are super helpful. Thank you so much for your support. Now let's fly right back into this list. Number nine. He became Super Patriot. Before becoming Captain America, John Walker tried the hero gig just in another fashion. First, he was the Super Patriot. He made a spectacular first appearance in Captain America 323. And John Walker was standing up for America and its true ideals. Nice. He even chose July 4th to make his grand entrance. What a patriot. What a super patriot. So Cap walks by as this is happening when he's making his big debut and he sees a big poster with his face on it with a big red X through the center. It's kind of like America's Got Talent. And then on the other side, we see the super patriot with a big yes on his side. Okay, that's odd. So now he's starting to publicly shame Captain America in front of his supporters. He's trying to win over the crowd. And if a cool America monologue wasn't enough to do it, he had his own buck, the bold urban commandos. There were three of them and they staged attacks to make John Walker look better. But you could only look so good until number eight fought Captain America. So where John and his three bold urban commandos staged another attack, Captain America arrived to save the day. And then readers get treated to a star-spangled battle. And John puts up a pretty good fight as well. He can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Captain America. Thanks, Power Broker. It worked. They end up battling it out for 27 minutes straight. 27 minutes. That's like a full TV episode of just getting punched in the face. That's terrible. But Super Patriot was never able to really land a blow on Cap, and Cap was never able to keep Super Patriot down. So they're just standing there out of breath for 27 minutes like, now what? So Super Patriot leaves before doing the worst thing ever in all of this. He calls Steve a loser, and then he runs away. Number seven, no rules. Captain America 332, the villain Warhead drops in via parachute with a message. Make war some more. Signed, Warhead. You know, in case we confused him with somebody else falling from the skies. He set up a table on top of the Washington Monument, and then he pulled out a nuclear device. So it's not looking like a good situation at all. Perfect time for a hero like Super Patriot. Yeah, he came in and used his powers and saved the day, proving that he can indeed be worthy of the hero life. Well, he tried to, but it didn't go as well as he planned. He climbed up the side, up to Warhead and his well-balanced table, and then he started hucking throwing stars at him at first, hit him in the face a couple times. And then when that didn't work and he was close enough, he just grabbed the table and threw it into a diving board of doom and just hucked this guy right off into the skies. And he did not survive the fall at all. I mean, you could have handled this in literally any other way. You have superpowers. Come on, use your head. Number six, from the torch to Wonder Man. The first human torch was not actually Johnny Storm, but was an android created by Professor Phineas Horton himself. Ultron, wanting to make his own such creation, kidnapped the professor and forced him to build an android being for Ultron's own purposes, which we talked about a little bit earlier. The professor, of course, modeled the synthesoid after his own creation, but a little too closely for Ultron's liking, as I said, bestowing the human torch's memories as well to the creation we'd later come to know as Vision. Brought to life, this being attacked Ultron, who had killed the Professor as punishment for his betrayal. Unfortunately, Torch Vision, this version of Vision, was no match for Ultron, and in the end, he actually ended up being reprogrammed by Ultron to follow his orders, and was given the brain patterns of Wonder Man. Nothing against Wonder Man, by the way, but sharing brain patterns with that hero would cause lots of weirdness for Vision and for Scarlet Witch as well later on down the line. I feel like if you get a pick who you want to share brain patterns with, Wonder Man's not at the top of the list. Also, it's really weird that like Wonder Man's brain patterns were just lying around Hank Pym's lab in like a little recorder device. It's like, why did you have those, Hank Pym? What's going on? Number five, no one to help. 
This point has some more specific spoilers for the latest episode of WandaVision, episode 6. So if you haven't gotten there yet, you maybe want to skip this one if you want to avoid spoilers, or if you haven't seen it but you're like, I'm living through the spoilers, man, which is fine. In the latest episode of WandaVision, it's Halloween in Westview as we proceed along our sitcom timeline into the world of basically kind of a Malcolm in the Middle inspired era, which uh, aired actually in the 2000s, despite this episode having a very 90s feel and despite that series having a 90s feel. Trying to solve the mystery of what's really going on in Westview, Vision lies to Wanda about not being able to join her and the kids trick-or-treating due to being on duty for Neighborhood Watch. Now in reality, he actually spends the evening investigating Westview and eventually finds the town's reality warping barrier, which he attempts to cross, not knowing that this will likely end up killing him. As outside of this altered reality, which it's hinted at is numbered as 2800 in the MCU, despite the fact that I think that number is already taken in the comics, Vision is in fact dead. When he moves to leave the town, we watch as he struggles against the magical barrier, which obviously very much wants to keep him within town limits. Sword watches as he attempts to move into their world seeing him fall to pieces, slowly dissolving in front of them. And as a handcuffed Darcy Lewis shouts for them to do something, like help this man. But that doesn't end up happening. They just run. In the end, it's up to Wanda to save the day when Billy alerts her that he senses that his dad is in danger. Wiccan to the rescue. Number four, manipulated into being a villain. I really do feel for Vision. Most of the most terrible things that have happened to him in the comics or otherwise are honestly my worst nightmare, which is being controlled by other people. In this case, we're talking about when he was sent in to kill the Avengers and seemingly in some kind of murderous trance. Once the team attempted to reason with him, it became apparent that this synthozoid enemy wasn't all he appeared to be, and in fact that he might not truly be acting of his own volition. In the end, Vision would end up becoming an ally to the Avengers, fighting against his instincts to do them harm. They'd actually help him by deprogramming his murderous urges, and he would eventually go on to join the Avengers outright, fighting many times against his creator and father, Ultron. Many times. Many times. Ultron never stays dead. Number three, infected with a Hydra virus. During the events of Secret Empire, Steve Rogers would end up having his whole life history rewritten and be revealed as a longtime sleeper agent for Hydra. Our heroes would, however, find out too late about Rogers' true allegiances true allegiances, and so Captain America would become Captain Hydra, or Hydra Supreme, and would take over the United States of America for the glory of Hydra. But he would also end up recruiting some of Earth's mightiest heroes besides, including Scarlet Witch and Vision. But how did he convince them to join the side of evil? Well, he didn't. For Wanda, Hydra actually awoke Cthon within her in order to take control of her body and make use of her powers. And if you want to learn more about Cthon and that whole thing, you can check out the worst things that happened to Wanda's list where we talk about that a bit more. For Vision, being a synthesoid, they merely infected him with a virus. That was easy. And although Vision tried to fight it, he remained unable to break free and fight against Hydra until near the end of the event. Like the second last issue, I believe, in the main one. Secret Empire number nine. Number two, death. While well, those who only knew Vision from the MCU might think of his tear-jerking demise in Endgame, comic fans know that a fate worse than being destroyed, at least the first time around, awaited him in the comics. Here, instead of Wanda destroying him at his own request, urging her on with words of affirmation and love, Vision ends up being controlled against his will by her, which leads to him ending up in a direct conflict that he doesn't actually want any part of, which ultimately leads to his very gruesome death. Not only does he melt and vomit up silver pods, which transform into Ultron bots, but Overkill comes into play when She-Hulk then decides to go into a rage and ends up tearing him down the middle, which is a pretty epic and permanent kind of on-panel death. Although, of course, even if you get ripped down the middle, that's probably not the end of you, because comics. Vision is still a synthetic being, and he can be recreated. So don't worry, he would be rebuilt, and he would return once more. But what a death to come back from. Number one, weaponized. 
During the events of Avengers Disassembled, which led right into House of M, Wanda ended up suffering from a mental break, and as such ended up turning on her fellow Avengers. You'd think Vision, being one of the Avengers who, you know, is married to Wanda, would be safe, but no. Wanda ended up not only getting him killed, but it was the way in which she did it, I think, that just really cut him deep. She didn't just put him in the right places to be torn apart by She-Hulk, but she actually turned him into a weapon to be used against his friends and teammates, the Avengers. Vision actually warned them when he came to them that he was no longer in control of his body before vomiting up those pods, which turned into Ultron robot drones, who then attacked the Avengers after their mansion had already been attacked. This was just a real bad day all around for the whole team. When Vision returned to life and Wanda, much later, came to ask for forgiveness, it would actually be this memory that would prevent him from being able to forgive his wife, Scarlet Witch. He was like, I can forgive the fact that you had a mental break, but you literally turned me against my friends and made me like hurt them and some of them died. It's like pretty crazy. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Phoenix. Baron Zemo's whole thing is following in your father's footsteps. I mean, sure, sometimes it's not hard if your father's not a supervillain, but when Baron Zemo was dealing with the passing of his father, he was an engineer at the time and he was quite smart. Add that in with a little bit of grudge towards Captain America and bam, you get very, very desperate. He became this new persona and called himself Phoenix, but this resulted in him just getting whooped, but this time he got whooped in a cool costume. Luckily, Sam Wilson came into the rescue and Zemo, or I mean Phoenix, fell into a vat of adhesive X and it changed his appearance forever. Sometimes you start out as a different hero, fall into some acid, and then you're like, you know what? I'm gonna wear a mask. I think I'm gonna wear a mask forever. Guys, before we go on to this list of not so great times of Baron Zemo, if you wanna go ahead and give this video a like, that would be great. It really does help us out a lot here in our studio. Thank you so much, you guys are the best. Thanks for supporting. Now let's get right back into this list. Number nine, put on the mask. Okay, so he fell into Adhesive X and now he needs a cool mask. Every cool supervillain needs a cool mask. Even if you can't understand what they're saying half the time. In episode three of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Zemo finds a purple mask alongside other family goods. It's like a supervillain garage sale. There's a car, there's some outfits, some cool weapons. But what's the story behind this mask? Why did he give it such the long look? Why is he so coy with it? Well, in the comics, Zemo's father, Heinrich Zemo, the OG Baron Zemo, had a mask permanently stuck to his face after he messed around with Adhesive X. So after Heinrich passed, he figured he'd continue on with this mask tradition, but thankfully he didn't super glue it to his own face or anything horrible like that, because that would be just, I wouldn't want to see that in the show at all. Not at all. Well, maybe a little bit. No, not at all. While it's fun to see a comic accurate setup for Baron Zemo, I get the feeling his villain roots have only just been planted. Number eight, Masters of Evil. Every supervillain needs a super squad, and this idea was called the Masters of Evil. They came to life in the comics in Avengers issue 273. Zemo was still trying to get that sweet, sweet revenge on Captain America, but he was outmanned. So he's already copying his dad enough, he might as well bring back his dad's idea of a super crew. Let's do it. His own personal team of super villains, and they weren't too shabby off the bat either. Just two issues later, the Masters of Evil took on the Avengers and gave them a run for their money. Number seven, the Sad Dad Reunion. This next one takes place from Captain America issue 357 to issue 362. Ah, the distance one will go for family, especially Baron Zemo. It can be pretty overwhelming especially when he tries to bring his father back to life. Yeah, that happened. With the help of Batroc's brigade, a team of mercenaries led by Batroc the Leaper, Zemo used the Bloodstone to resurrect his father, but the conversation that followed wasn't exactly hopeful. You know how like in Avengers Endgame, where Tony Stark goes back in time and he has that one last conversation with his dad and it helps him get the strength and courage to actually sacrifice himself by the end of the film? It closes his loop, it closes his character arc. This doesn't happen. At all. He brought his father back to find out, well, that his father was actually nothing but disappointed in Baron. This is a fun six-parter, but man, I can't help but feel bad for Baron. Villain or not, sometimes it's best just to let dead things lay. Number six, death of Captain America. The supposed death, anyways. Steve would later, of course, return, but yes, at the time, people thought that Steve Rogers was dead dead. After he was shot through what looked to be the neck, yikes, and then later the gut, and yeah, anyways, he's fine, it's all fine. Bucky himself was initially believed to be the culprit, even by Falcon, and the two had a quick scuffle before Bucky explained he'd rather take his own life first before allowing himself to ever harm Steve. 
Aww. Bucky also then revealed that he was talking to the Nick Fury on comms and was only in the building that the sniper had sniped from because he was attempting to apprehend the person responsible, which then led to Falcon and Bucky teaming up to do so. Number 5. Used as a pawn in the Civil War This is more exclusive to the movies as Bucky didn't play quite as active a role in the first Civil War itself in the comics, but Winter Soldier was a huge part of the reason Iron Man and Captain America came to blows in the MCU's Civil War. Winter Soldier was revealed to be an assassin who was actually Captain America's brainwashed former BFF James Buchanan Barnes. Gasp! Barnes was framed for the explosive attack on the Vienna International Center during the signing of the Sokovia Accords by Helmut Zemo to create a rift between the supers. Barnes was free and was seeking to learn more of his true past, but Zemo also reactivated his programming to take hold of the Winter Soldier once more so that he could use him to tear apart the Avengers and turn them against one another, especially after he revealed that the Winter Soldier was actually the one responsible for killing Tony's parents. Number 4. Frozen Like Cap, Bucky Barnes was also frozen, being plunged into frozen waters and later retrieved by a Soviet submarine. Being frozen not only doesn't sound pleasant, cause you know, it's cold and uncomfortable and it hurts, but also it sounds pretty deadly. Bucky was lucky he survived actually. In fact, the scientists that were to study him weren't even sure that it would be possible to revive him, and after studying him for two weeks without finding any traces of the super soldier serum that they had been looking for and hoping to find in his blood, they decided to put him back on ice. Ugh. Bucky was put into stasis mode for 9 years before he would be revived again so that he could be transformed and weaponized. Number 3. Brainwashed Bucky was believed dead after he went missing in action. In reality, we later learned that while he had lost his arm in the incident that people believed had killed him, Bucky himself had actually survived. Unfortunately, it was the Soviet Union who had found him and took him in. Keeping his discovery a secret, they brainwashed Barnes, making him loathe the West, turning him into a a cyborg, giving him a cybernetic arm in place of the one that he'd lost, and began training him to turn him into their very own weapon and assassin. Number 2. Recaptured The Winter Soldier, it should be noted, has escaped his captors in the past, but sadly, due to having his brains kinda scrambled, was never able to free himself fully due to the fact that he found himself confused without his handlers and lost. After the assassination of Senator Harry Baxter, the Winter Soldier missed making his extraction point and instead disappeared, going off the grid. Unfortunately for him, without his puppet masters controlling him, he didn't really know where to turn or what to do, and he ended up being recaptured by them shortly thereafter, eventually being located in New York and then taken back in. They decided that his return to America must have triggered something in him, wiped his brain, and were careful to note in his file that missions that would take him to the USA should be avoided in the future. Number one used as a deadly weapon. In the MCU and in the comics, the Winter Soldier is brainwashed and programmed to be an assassin and a weapon, which is probably why he and Black Widow get along so well in the comics and even end up together romantically now and then. They both understand what it's like to be made into a monster, to be manipulated into doing evil deeds that they probably ordinarily wouldn't have done otherwise, but that they still obviously carry a lot of guilt about. The Winter Soldier was used to take out a ton of targets over the years, including Howard Stark and Maria Stark in the MCU, and in the the comics, Nomad, Wolverine's Love, Itsu Akahiro, and President John F. Kennedy, to name a few. Number 10. A Date with the Devil In New Mutants Volume 3, Issue 30, we find Mephisto taking a pretty strange deal. I mean, compared to his normal read the fine print soul collecting type of deal, that is. This time around, a team of X-Men accidentally enter the home of Mephisto, the underworld, literally hell. So we offered to let them go about their super business and leave hell on one condition. That condition being that he gets a date night with Amara Aquila. So the team encourages her to say no, but she seals the deal. Mephisto says, hey, I'll call you, and then whoosh, they're all gone. Just like that, the team is free. So the team rescued Blink and then Amara prepared for her date. Issue 37, titled A Date with the Devil, we see Magma double checking that she looks good for her date night coming up. Making sure the curls look good, eyeliner is great, we're looking good, let's do it. And just like prom night, her man arrives at the door with flowers. What a gentleman. So they dine, of course, in the third circle of hell overlooking a lake of lava with volcanoes going off. It's quite the spectacle. I mean, Niagara Falls, hell, you know, both are pretty romantic. And of course, they had an amazing pit band to set the mood. She returns back to normal life and admits that she had a pretty decent time once he stopped trying so hard. See, usually when a friend goes on a date, you know, it's exciting to see how it went. Now, imagine if your roommate went on a date with the devil. Oh my God, the amount of tea I would make them spill, we'd never sleep, we'd talk all night. I'd also be worried sick. I'd be like, hey, how was your night? He was the devil, so are you good? Is your soul good? Awesome. As far as force deals go, this one wasn't too bad. 
but there's plenty, plenty more on this list. And before we get to number nine, guys, if you could go ahead and give this video a thumbs up because it really helps out our studio quite a bit. Thank you so much for watching. Now back to this crazy list. Number nine, closing time. If you've worked at a bar, you know it's the worst when people stay right until the very end, right until closing time. Or even worse, they'll show up minutes before you're about to get out of there. Like three minutes before last call, someone will walk in, grab a drink, and then they'll just chill and unwind the entire night, which is fine, but sometimes you're like, hey man, I've been here for 10 hours, I gotta go home. Now imagine if one of those late night visits was from Mephisto. See, in Journey into Mystery issue 627, we see another hobby of the devils besides taking souls that bartenders will tell stories of. What he would do is show up every night to a random bar or a pub, and then he tells a story. He vents, he lets things off his chest. And if you listen and survive, he'll give you a really nice tip. And I'm talking like a really, really nice tip. You don't have to work anymore at a bar after that point. But if you slip up, things can go pretty south pretty fast. Now this amuses Mephisto. He enjoys playing along and chatting it up with the poor soul who offered to pick up that ship that night. I wonder if I want to see him one night, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Actually, no, let's not see him. Let's let's not do that. Number eight, what happens in Vegas? Doctor Strange Damnation is a four-parter that puts Mephisto and Doctor Strange in the most epic game of blackjack. Yeah, you thought Casino Royale had like the high stakes? Mm -mm. No devil involved, no way, just Daniel Craig. So following the destruction of Las Vegas after Hydra's short-lived empire, Doctor Strange tried putting the city back to normal using his magic. But in doing so, it resulted in this hotel emerging from the ground and that hotel just happened to be Hotel Inferno. And of course, inside that hotel is Mephisto. Yeah, it turns out when the city went down, Mephisto claimed all of their souls in hell. So in order to come to an agreement to save the city and the people inhabiting it, a game of brimstone blackjack was in order. I mean, being forced on a date is one thing, but a game of blackjack with the devil? I mean, what a, what a better way to start an adventure. Number seven. Master Pandemonium. Martin Preston made his comic book appearance in West Coast Avengers Volume 2, Issue 4. He was a student at Juilliard and a big time Hollywood star. I mean, the guy was killing it. He had money, fame, he was in his 50s, but the guy looked like he was early 40s. Just killing it, just killing the game. Then he thought it would be a cool idea to drink and drive. Not a cool idea, never do that. So of course, after the crash, he was approached by Mephisto, and Mephisto had repaired his arm by calling forward a demon. Imagine if Bucky had his arm replaced by a demon. God, it would be a mess. Leaving a five point shaped hole in his chest, Mephisto had lied to Martin and said that it's because he had separated his soul into five different places among Earth's dimension. That was, in fact, a lie. In actuality, Mephisto had replaced his other limbs with demons as well. So now he's a walking, talking Trojan horse for the devil. Number six. Game Captain America. One of the biggest game changers in the MCU was when John Walker came out at the end of the episode, winked at the camera, and then showed us his brand new Captain America suit in the meantime. This happened of course in the comics as well, when Steve Rogers had to abandon his identity due to the Red Skull's manipulation of the Commission on Superhuman Activities. So now somebody has to suit up, somebody has to take his spot. The government needed a new figure. So in issue 333 of Captain America, it was titled The Replacement. The government's weighing their options on who should be the next to lead the nation, so they go with the guy who just launched a dude off of a building. Awesome, John Walker just got the promotion of a lifetime. And now we're all screwed. Number five, Buck Upgrade. So now he's got a brand new suit, he's got the best frisbee of all time, but what else does John Walker need? Well, how about some backup for starters? He brings back the bold urban commandos who I mentioned earlier. The Buckies, as they're referred to, wore Captain America masks, boots, pants, but they were topless for some reason. I don't know, maybe they were into wrestling growing up. John's right-hand man, Lamar Hoskins, has been by John's side since the military, so he was obviously asked to be the main sidekick, who we also got to meet in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And he stood tall on the front cover of Captain America issue 334, and now he goes by the name Battlestar. The other two guys also got a cool upgrade, now they're referred to as left and right winger. They were cool until they revealed John's identity to the public, and then they were kind of not cool. Left winger and right winger tried to use John's old super patriot tech against him, but they were eventually beaten down and arrested. So now with his identity out and about, it was only time for John to take on another super alias. This time, number four, coming US agent. He's back, again, again. One of his more stylish looks, if you ask me, but John Walker returns, this time with a blacked out Captain America suit, and the shield is also less spangly. He comes back and he's put to the test. He's forced to battle an iron monger, and when he goes to take it down alone, the shield actually seems to work out pretty well for him. Because in the comics, it was actually Taskmaster who trained him how to use that shield in the first place. And judging by the trailers for Black Widow, because we still have to watch those until it's released, it looks like Taskmaster can throw a frisbee quite well. Number three, he 
join the Avengers. In West Coast Avengers issue 45, when Hawkeye sets up a team, well, on the West Coast, the government wanted an official in there to make sure all was going well. So funny enough, at this time in the comics, Vision was also trying to get government clearance again. So they sent in US agent. This led to John rescuing his former partner, Battlestar, from the power broker. So now this guy has his buddy back and he's part of the Avengers. That's a pretty risky spot to put John Walker. I hope we never see him join the Avengers on the big screen, but seeing White Vision in the mix now kind of makes me nervous. Maybe the West Coast Avengers will happen. Maybe, just maybe. Number two, he joined the Force Works. After the West Coast Avengers fell apart, because naturally that's what happens when John Walker is part of the team, the costume and the shield were tossed to the side. So Tony Stark put together an all new team known as Force Works. Scarlet Witch talked John Walker into joining the team because she honestly believed that John was the backbone to the entire squad. She kind of liked how he would run things. So he planned on running the team on tight military lines and the values of strength and dedication. So John joined the team and he wore a fancy new suit with an upgraded shield. This time it was an energy shield. John remained a member and went against the Kree, the Scatter, and the Mandarin. He was doing an all right job until he reverted back to his old ways. One mission had Forceworks team up with the Avengers and that wasn't a pleasant reunion. John Walker went into conflict with War Machine and Hawkeye, so he had to quit the Force Works as well. God, you can't put this guy anywhere. And last but not least, number one, he took the serum. In the emotional ending of episode four, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we find out what John Walker did to the remaining vial of the Super Soldier serum. He took it. Yeah. Zemo broke most of them, except for one. John talked it over with Lamar Hoskins about if he would take the serum if presented the opportunity. So when Walker is, he does in fact take it, and it's shown to us in a pretty brutal way. While looking for Lamar, Walker reunited with Sam, and then they were all ambushed by the Flag Smashers, Nico and Dovik included. Now, Nico held back Walker for a moment, just long enough that Carly Morgenthau would attack Walker. Now, luckily, Lamar got in the way, and then that's when Carly accidentally delivered a fatal blow to Lamar. And this caused John Walker to lash out, and it's pretty bad. He can't control himself at this point. The serum has made him powerful and even more insane. And when he's attacking Nico in the heat of the moment, he goes a little bit too far. Poor Nico. This was the same episode where he told Carly that he was actually a Captain America fan growing up. So, double. Kicking off the list at number 10. Del Rusk. Once upon a time, the Red Skull actually weaseled his way into the position of US Secretary of Defense. Except this time, he was using the identity of Del Rusk. This begins in Avengers Volume 3, Issue 65. So, Del Rusk decided to develop and test this biological weapon at Mount Rushmore. It's this horrible dust that really does a lot of damage to all the hikers. Everybody just out there enjoying their day. I mean, it's midday, one of the most beautiful places in the world, and Del Rusk just destroys this entire area. Kids are coughing in cars. People can't see where they're driving. It's honestly madness. Now, this dust was actually a flesh-eating virus that left burns all over your skin. It got so bad that the Avengers had to suit up in hazmat suits. And then in the next issue, in the Red Zone Part 2, Black Panther beat him up so badly that he broke Red Skull's jaw right in half. That's more than fair considering the hysteria you've caused. And before we go on to number 9, if you guys could go ahead and give us a thumbs up on this video. It does magical wonders for our page. It's really helpful. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for supporting. Now back to the list on Red Skull. Number 9. Ultimate Red Skull. Making his debut in the Ultimate Comics, Avengers 1, back in 2009, Ultimate Red Skull is a little different than the Red Skull we know from our main continuity. He's actually the son of Steve Rogers and Gail Richards. They even hit him and trained him to become the next Captain America. It's just, it's wild. The Ultimates are insane. So he always feared that he would never live up to his father's expectations. I mean, fair. And then at just age 17, he took out all these doctors and soldiers around him in the military. And now he was in charge. And now his new goal was planning a way out. He then got the haunting look by using a kitchen knife and carving his head, which is just lovely. There you go. That's a nice image for you all on this lovely day. Number eight, Streets of Poison. This next one goes down during Captain America issue 376 to 378, when Red Skull had initially offered up an alliance with Kingpin. But why? Well, because there was this narcotic that the Red Skull was trying to bring into New York, but Wilson Fisk refused to work with somebody like the Red Skull. So now we got two villains not cooperating with each other, so next comes a full-on drug war. Now, luckily, Kingpin took down Red Skull. I mean, when it comes to hand-in-hand -hand combat, even Spider-Man struggles with Kingpin, so of course he's doomed. Big fists, it's like Donkey Kong. So he went down, and Kingpin actually spared his life on the condition that he just stays away from his territory. What are you, Walter White? Don't bring that stuff in here. Get out of here. I'm the one who knocks. 
you out. Bam, kingpin. Number seven, Mother Superior. After the Red Skull's revival, he figured he needed to start a family. Well, rather, he just figured he needed a heir to his evil throne after he retires. So he fathered a daughter on Exile Island to a washerwoman. Sadly, she didn't make it after the birth, but Johan raised this young daughter in this mansion called the Skull House. Clever name, I get it. Skull, Red Skull, nice. But because this is the Red Skull, it wasn't an ordinary life at all. See, through advanced biological means, he made it so she would become an adult in a very short period of time. And of course, if that wasn't already hectic enough, he set her up with some superpowers. That daughter being appropriately named Sin, short for Cynthia Schmidt. But she went on to become Mother Superior, the leader of a group called the Sisters of Sin, where other orphan girls would come along and go through the same process. You've just made a new villain, way to go. Number six broke up the band. When Thanos finally decided to get out of that big old chair and start hunting down the Infinity Stones, he took out the Avengers group by group. He punched the Hulk so hard in the neck that the Hulk retired. But when you think about why our heroes were so divided in the first place, you have to give Zemo props for making it a hell of a lot easier for the Mad Titan. An empire toppled by its enemies can rise again, but one which crumbles from within that's dead forever. Waited in a bunker for Steve, Bucky, and Stark to show up in Captain America's Civil War, and when they did, the five Winter Soldiers each were already taken out by Zemo. Yeah, it turns out he never meant to actually wake the other Winter Soldiers up at all. No, instead, it was revealed to Stark that Bucky was actually the cause of his parents' untimely death all those years ago. It was a mission to retrieve other Winter Soldier serums, and because the Winter Soldier was the one to take them, there can't be any survivors or witnesses. Sorry, Tony. This, of course, sent Tony and Steve into one of the most heartbreaking battles in the MCU, and it ended with Tony taking off Bucky's arm and Cap dropping the shield, walking away. The two didn't meet back up until after Thanos had snapped away half of all the life in the universe, all because Zemo and his perfectly timed viewing party. Good work. Number five, Zola's creations. When he first came out as Baron Zemo way back, he originally had worked with Arnim Zola, and in Captain America issue 275, he worked with these ugly creations, these monsters, it was so gross. Yeah, he teamed up with Primus and kidnapped Steve Rogers' friend from his childhood in order to lure Steve into a trap. And then in the next issue, Cap was fighting off all these monsters, which was just a mess, and then to add insult to injury, literally, Zemo then revealed that he knew Captain America's true identity. Of course, he's standing all cool too with his squad. So villainy, so villainy. Number four, he framed Bucky. So a quick trip to an ex-Hydra member's house, Zemo now has some information and his next step was to frame the Winter Soldier, Bucky Barnes, by using the book, the Winter Soldier book. He framed him so that the world would think that Bucky is the one responsible for an explosion that ended the life of King Chaka. Now, all this just happened to go down during the time of the signing of the Accords, of course. So Zemo made it look like Bucky did the whole thing, and then Bucky got arrested and held at the Joint Counter Terrorist Center building, where he was set to be evaluated by a doctor. Now, the doctor never showed up, but who really showed up was Baron Zemo. He posed as a psychiatrist named Theo Broussard. Then he pulls out this handy little Hydra book, he wraps off some karate kick keywords, and Bucky is back into punchy mode, leaving quite the mess in the building. Number three. Missile Madness. Near the end of World War II, Bucky and Cap were trying to disarm a bomb on a plane while an attempt to take down none other than Baron Zemo. Now Steve fell off the wing of the plane, falling into freezing water where he remained frozen, awaiting his fate as a super soldier out of time. But Bucky though, a little different than what we saw in the movie. See, Bucky rode the missile out and then he was thought to have not survived the explosion, but he did. His body also fell into the freezing waters, and just then, a Soviet spy submarine just happened to be in the area crossing between the English Channel. So they scooped him up, fixed him up a brand new shiny arm, brainwashed him into becoming this unstoppable assassin. So thanks to Zemo, we got two birds in one stone, or one missile, rather. Number two, the Thunderbolts. So in the time of comics where Onslaught had destroyed the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, Baron Zemo thought that there needs to be a new team out there. So hey, why not rebrand the Masters of Evil to just look like the good guys? Seems pretty easy. They wanted cities to trust them, and after all, who wouldn't trust a group of superpowered beings in tights? Of course we'll trust you. Why not? I mean, we're seeing this being played out in the MCU. People love New Cap. I mean, they did until he turned insane. Just because you have a chin strap doesn't mean that we trust you. Moral of the story. Now, I really hope that he ends up creating the Thunderbolts in the MCU here as well. He clearly has shown us that he can control a large group of superpowered beings because he does so without them even knowing most of the time. And finally, number one, he shot Carly Morgenthau. See, normally when somebody tries to take down a villain, it's a good thing. Like, ah, oh, finally, Flag Smasher, that guy who's breaking all those windows and ruining flag factories, he's done? Sweet, we can finally go back to work, awesome. Usually it's a good thing when a villain gets taken down. 
But in Falcon and Winter Soldier, Flag Smasher is a little different than the Flag Smasher in the comics. So Carly Morgenthau and Sam Wilson are talking things out. They're seeing eye to eye. They're just people who have been through hell and back and they're trying to make sense of this ever-changing world. And then US Agent comes in, acts like a dum-dum, and then Carly takes off thinking that the whole thing was just a setup. And as if it couldn't get any worse, Zemo is waiting around the corner, ready to handle it himself after breaking free of New Cap's handcuffs. He shoots her, and then he continues to shoot her. This guy's insane. Like, way to make things worse for Carly. You could have just danced and let everyone else handle this, but you had to be a jerk. Nice. Kicking off the list at number 10, Smacked by Thanos. We got to see Captain America and many others get the beatdown of their lives in Avengers Infinity War. But in the comic, in Infinity Gauntlet, it was somehow even more brutal. Yet in part four of Jim Starlin's The Infinity Gauntlet, Thanos at one point weakens himself while maintaining the stones because he wanted to take on the Avengers in a more equal fight. All of this just to impress death. So he makes himself weak and then fist fights them, it's crazy. So Captain America is leading the Avengers into battle and at this point, everybody is getting hit. Cyclops gets his head stuck in a clear block of force. Vision gets his insides just torn out. And then Thanos sees Cap as having such an emotional outburst. And then after Thanos destroys Cap's shield, he gives him the mighty backhand of a lifetime, knocking him out cold. And before we continue on to number nine, guys, if you could just go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, because it really goes a long way for us here at the studio. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now back to the video. Number nine, he lost Bucky. Okay, 2005 was a wild time. We got to see Jason Todd return as the Red Hood and Marvel had their own type of super sleeper assassin come back from the dead as well, Bucky Barnes. In 2005, Bucky Barnes returned, but of course he was never the same. Near the end of World War II, Bucky and Cap were trying to disarm a bomb on a plane while taking down Baron Zemo. The bomb went off, hurling Steve and Bucky into the freezing waters. And well, as for Cap, he came out of this pretty good. He remained frozen, just hanging out. And Bucky, he didn't end up so lucky. His body fell into the freezing waters, and at the time, a Soviet spy submarine was in the area crossing the English Channel. So they scooped him up, fixed the whole left arm situation, brainwashed him, and turned him into this brutal assassin. It's heartbreaking. See, he has all these incredible abilities that make him a fierce warrior, but he doesn't remember how he got them, making him this deadly assassin and a super crazy villain to handle. This is Steve's right-hand man. Every conflict that they go through is just painful. One of the biggest turning points of Marvel was the introduction of the Winter Soldier. This was a conflict that came to life on the big screen back in 2014 with the Winter Soldier, and we're kind of still seeing Bucky try and figure this life out. With the Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming next month on Disney+, Plus, we can see even more of what he has to go through post-Winter Soldier times. Number 8, Hail Hydra. This next one resulted in writer Nick Spencer getting death threats. That's right, so fans were mostly not okay with this one. Back in 2016, Captain America said two words that would throw every comic book fan for a loop. Hail Hydra. It all went down in 2017 Secret Wars when Captain America's reality had been rewritten secretly by Kobik, who was a sentient cosmic cube acting under the influence of the Red Skull. So as a child, Steve was recruited and raised to believe in their ideology, which was the strong ruling for the weak, for the good of all. Now there's a pleasant nod to this in Avengers Endgame, of course, when the team goes back in time to the first Avengers plot. We see Steve get in the elevator to try and get the scepter, and then we see the whole Hydra slash shield elevator stocked full of guys. Now we don't know this at the time, but that's full Hydra, but Steve knows this. So instead of beating everybody up and kicking ass in the elevator like he did in Winter Soldier, he just said, Hail Hydra. And then just like that, he walked out of the elevator with a smirk on his face. It was beautiful. Number seven, Old Man Cap. At the end of Avengers Endgame, now that we're talking about it, we see Captain America return the Infinity Stones. Only he doesn't shoot back to the present day after he's done. No, he sticks around, hangs out with Peggy, dances the night away. And then we see him as an old man giving the shield down to Sam Wilson just minutes later. It's a lovely end to Chris Evans' run on the character. You got a lot of feels. But in the comics, we also saw an old Captain America, but this time it wasn't on his terms. The Iron Nail sucked all of Cap's serum out, leaving him not ripped, but also not young as well. So now Steve looked 90, and there's no way you're gonna fight at that age, let alone pick up a shield. So he would lead the Avengers and call out orders from the radio. It sounds like a pretty sweet job for us, but for Steve, he's probably like, man, this is the most boring job I've had in my entire life. Number six. Johnny Blaze. Marvel Spotlight Issue 5, we see a legend being born, the Ghost Rider. See, Johnny Blaze was a stunt performer, and when his stepfather, Crash Simpson, got cancer, Johnny opted to make a deal with Mephisto to save him. And then when Crash tried to return to the stunt life, he 
crashed. So now Johnny's upset and he has a few choice words for the devil. So crash still ended up passing away after all, just not from cancer. Kind of not a great deal. So when Mephisto returned to collect his soul, because he thinks that's a fair deal, Roxanne intervened and used the spell of banishment from one of Johnny's books. Before Mephisto got cast away, he grafted the essence of the demon Zarathos to Johnny's body, thus creating the Ghost Rider. Imagine if Roxanne hadn't showed up, he would have just tricked another poor person into trading souls for some lousy deal. Careful what you wish for, folks. Number five, Silver Surfer. When Mephisto first came into Marvel Comics, many thought it was during the events of Ghost Rider, like I just mentioned. He actually tried taking Norrin Rad's soul before in Silver Surfer issue three. The power and the prize. The story begins with the Silver Surfer being tracked down by Mephisto because he's drawn to his power and nobility. What a perfect soul to take. The guy's great. He sees him as an obstacle of course, because he's the Silver Surfer and he's amazing. So Mephisto captures Norrin Rad's love to use as bait, but the Silver Surfer beat him down. He's one of the few Marvel heroes that actually had defeated Mephisto. So honestly, if the devil ends up showing up in WandaVision at some point, I wouldn't be surprised if the Silver Surfer is next up shortly after. I think we're going to go more cosmic, especially with Thor 4. Definitely with Thor 4. Number 4. Cynthia Von Doom. The mother of Victor Von Doom. She was known, of course, to dabble in the dark arts. She often communicated with demons and used spells. She was born in Latveria into a Romani clan and her people were constantly facing persecution at the hands of the Baron and his men. So she turned to Mephisto to make a deal, promising her soul in exchange to punish them. So he gave her powers to take care of them, but the only thing was that same power would also also take care of the children that were there as well. So he gave her the power, but just not the control. So she couldn't live with herself after what she had done to the children, so she made her husband promise that her son would never follow her footsteps. And then after that, her soul moved to her forever home, which was hell. Number three, using James Mandarin. Doctor Strange Volume 2, Issue 15, titled, Were There Smoke? We see Mephisto use James Mandarin as a pawn against Doctor Strange. Brutal. So the issue kicks off with Doctor Strange saving a woman from a fire. And when he returns home, he meets up with Clea. But before they can even catch up, a man named James Mandarin comes to the door. But he has a knife in his hand and he claims to know who and what Doctor Strange truly is. But Doctor Strange plays it cool, of course. James does not play it cool. See, he wants to be Strange's disciple. So he slashes at his own throat to make Doctor Strange use his powers and save him. What a power play. Also, you're so insane, but power play indeed. So Strange heals him up, of course, and he proudly puts it together that no normal doctor could have patched him up that fast. And then out pops the devil to make things just that much more exciting. So now the next issue is Strange saving his love from the afterlife. So while Strange waits for the help of Wong to get him out of there, he has to then face off against all sorts of illusions and deceptions unleashed by the devil. They're trying to change him into one of the Hell Lord's minions. So Wanda Maximoff is playing a role in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. So I feel like WandaVision will introduce Mephisto and then in his movie, he'll have to go in and finish off the Unholy Terrors with Wanda's help. Number two, Fragments of Greater Darkness. So Avengers West Coast Volume 2 issue 52, we find out the truth behind Scarlet Witch's children, Billy and Tommy. Again, this is another WandaVision theory that I think is happening. Listen up, here we go. So like I said earlier, these five pieces of Pandemonium's soul were actually Mephisto's. So Mephisto tricked Pandemonium and then gathered beings possessing the appropriate fragments. Two of those five fragments just happened to be children of Scarlet Witch and Vision. So when Pandemonium arrived, he took the kids, which in turn gave Mephisto full strength and then this, of course, left Scarlet Witch having a breakdown. Again, it's been hinted at that Agnes in WandaVision is actually Agatha Harkness, which would make sense. She's a witch. And then in episode six, we saw everybody in their comic accurate look, and she was, of course, rocking the witch outfit. Coincidence? I think not. And finally, number one, One More Day. We finish off with this four-parter, the One More Day Spider-Man storyline. It began in 2007 in Amazing Spider-Man issue 544, and instead of Pete dealing with the usual thugs or some enhanced science villain with a tail, we see Spider-Man make a deal with the devil. So after Spider-Man revealed his identity in the Civil War storyline, people of course were after him now. So when a bullet strikes Aunt May instead of Peter, he of course feels like he's the one to blame. Absolutely, you took your mask off, that's what happens. Even the opening of the story, it shows Aunt May in a hospital bed with Peter at her side, talking about how she was perfectly fine just a mere days ago. It's very sad. And Mephisto has entered the chat once again. He offers Peter a deal while Aunt May is dying. So basically what happens is that the world will forget about Peter's identity and Aunt May will live. But the whole Mephisto magic is that MJ and Peter never got married. That's just gonna go away. So it's a lose-lose and you're just trying to be a superhero. So they hug one final time and MJ explains that their love was always meant to be and that whatever Mephisto does is unstoppable. And then poof, the deal 
Nicholas Seal. The next day, Peter wakes up, all is fine and normal in his casual life. All that backstory was just wiped out in the turn of a page. Thanks to Mephisto, because your deals are just great. Number 10 is childhood. Superheroes usually don't have an easy childhood. Either they're bullied, they're born with advanced abilities that make them an outcast or a threat, or something traumatic happens with their parents. And in the case of Sam Wilson, he grew up in a tough neighborhood in Harlem, and his father Paul was a minister and tragically met his fate one night after trying to stop a fight between two gangs. Sam was only nine years old when this happened, and soon after, his mother Darlene was attacked by a mugger, and she didn't make it. She passed away protecting her children. Children. Sam, being so young and vulnerable, struggled with his parents' passing, and his path hasn't always been that of a hero's path, because before he became the Falcon, he became... Guys, before we continue on to number nine on our list, we just want to say thank you so much for watching, and if you haven't done so already, if you could go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, because it really does help us out on our channel quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Now back to some more Sam Wilson. Number nine. Snap Wilson. So after the death of his parents, Sam figured the next move would be to dip down into the criminal life. He was angry, he was upset. This was probably what I would have done. So he went by the name of Snap Wilson. And long ago in the comics, there was a Captain America and Falcon issue that said, revealed at last the true facts behind the origin of the Falcon. And then it says, today Falcon slays Captain America at the command of the Red School. What? So this history with Sam being a hustler was retconned so that the Red Skull had in fact used the Cosmic Cube in order to make Sam a criminal turned into captain. Now, it was apparently part of Red Skull's plan to use Falcon against Steve when the time was right down the road. Now, later on in Captain America issue 276, this retcon was cleared up even more when Sarah refers back to Snap Wilson yet again. She goes on to explain in that issue that it was all over the newspapers back when the Red Skull used Sam against Captain America. So many writers throughout many of these years of comics actually wanted to retcon the whole Snap Wilson phase, appropriately so. Number eight, the other Snap. I mean, turning into dust and vanishing for five years, that's, that's probably gotta suck. Now, of course, we have to mention Infinity War on this list. So when Thanos had all of the stones but one, everybody made a last effort to stop the Mad Titan, but it just wasn't enough power. Falcon tried to stop him by shooting his twin guns at him, but Thanos used the space stone on him to knock him out of the air onto the ground. Ouch. And then Thanos then gave each and every other Avenger a piece of pain, with Vision, of course, being last, having his Mind Stone pulled out of his forehead. And after he obtained all of the Infinity Stones, it just got worse. Falcon turned into ashes while he was crawling through the grass of Wakanda, and while he was fading out of existence, Rhodey was seen not too far behind him, calling out Sam's name. So sad, I was so happy when he came back, but like man, having that be the last that we saw of all these heroes for a whole year, that wasn't easy on my emotions. Number seven, Roscoe Simons. Roscoe was a Captain America fan, as we all are, and he got the opportunity of a lifetime in Captain America issue 181. He proved himself more than capable to carry the shield after Cap had left it, and it was up to Sam Wilson to train Roscoe Simons. So Sam had this mindset. He was hopeful that Roscoe would see the real life dangers of actually wearing this suit. It wasn't just Halloween, you put on a suit, you whip a frisbee, and then you're like, cool, I got him. It was scary, it was hard. It was at a time in the government where it wasn't a good idea to be this type of character. And he was hoping that he would retire. But in issue 182, Sam tells Roscoe that he's gonna look after him. So Falcon did his best to protect the new hero, but in the very next issue, we see front and center the death of a hero. It was pretty brutal as well how Red Skull took him out. It was a very public way in order to warn others who want to step up to that same mantle. Now poor Roscoe, but also poor Sam Wilson. He told this guy he'd watch his back and now he has his blood on his hands and also he has his blood on his future suit, which is not ideal. Number six, seeing red. Captain America issue 350. We have a front cover that is sure to draw you in. The supersized 350th issue. So after months of manipulation from the resurrected Red Skull, Steve Rock Rogers confronts and defeats his replacement, John Walker. Now he also has to battle Red Skull. His hands are literally full in this issue, it's great. But at this point, it's a little tough because the Red Skull is now a cloned Steve Rogers, and that includes having the super soldier powers as well, so it's not easy. So due to his dust of death, his red mask shrunk, and now that was his permanent face. 
So it's the return of Red Skull in a way. So Steve may have returned the mantle of Captain America now that John Walker's out of the picture, but now we have the return of one Red Skull yet again. Number five, Latveria. Sometimes you're not the only super villain who's planning on taking over the world. And when you step on some other villain's toes, well, now we got a problem. Kind of similar to how we tried to be shady with Kingpin. Red Skull once took over for Doctor Doom once he was absent as their ruler of Latveria. Now Red Skull actually tried to make this land a starting point for his end of the world plan. And when Doom got back, he wasn't pleased with how his country has been led. So much so that he actually used a shrink ray on Red Skull. You can see all this go down in issue 12 of Super Villain Team Up. It's quite fun. Nice short read too. Number four, steal Xavier's brain. Yeah, you heard me correctly. Okay, so when the cloned Red Skull wakes up in modern day, he still got the urge, of course, to take over the world and turn the population towards mutants. He went under and the, the world was crazy and then he came back up and he's like, well, I'm gonna still be crazy. And this guy loves experiments. He's super into the idea of becoming Steve Rogers and he loves moving consciousness around into computers. And it turns out he also has a thing for stealing brains. Gross. And what other brain to steal other than the best one on the planet, the one belonging to Charles Xavier. This all goes down after the events of Avengers vs. X-Men in Uncanny Avengers issue one. So Red Skull takes Xavier's brain to help him accomplish this task, this evil master plan. So now he's got telepathic abilities and he uses this to force humans to attack mutants all around the world. Luckily, that part of Xavier's brain was removed, taking away his telepathic powers, because, you know, we don't want any of that. Red Skull's already bad enough. We don't want to give him that kind of brain. Number three, Genosha. The Red Skull loves turning places into his own, evidently, and Genosha is just another place on that Schmidt list. Now, I talked about how he stole Xavier's brain, but later on in Uncanny Avengers issue 23, he turns Genosha into this camp, this horrible camp, where he abducted numerous mutants and inhumans. Now, the Avengers luckily escaped their captivity and rescued Magneto, and and let's just say he wasn't too pleased about this whole event. The Red Skull had made these evil sidekicks that he referred to as the S-Men, Again, great name, makes absolute sense. And after using the mutant growth hormone to enhance his powers, Magneto wiped out these S-Men and then took out the Red Skull. This all seemed fine and dandy at first, but then this led to another more powerful persona of Johan, the Red Onslaught. Now, luckily Scarlet Witch and Doctor Doom casted a spell that allowed Professor X to reawaken in his subconscious and took control of the Red Onslaught long enough for our heroes to take him down. But I mean, anything this guy does, no matter where you go, it just ends up in something worse coming up. It's kind of like how villains work. Number two, Hail Hydra. This next one resulted in writer Nick Spencer literally getting death threats. Fans were mostly not okay with this one at all. So back in 2016, Captain America said two words that would throw every comic book fan for a loop. Hail and Hydra. This all happened in Secret Wars, when Captain America's reality had been rewritten secretly by Kobik, a sentient cosmic cube acting under the influence of said Red Skull. So as a child, Steve was recruited and raised to believe in their ideology, which was, you know, the strong ruling the weak, for the good of all. Now there's a pleasant nod to this in Avengers Endgame, where the team goes back in time to the first Avengers movie, and then we think Steve is about to lay everybody out in this elevator, like he did in Winter Soldier, but a couple well-timed words made him skip the workout and simply walk out of the elevator with the scepter. Honestly, it's one of my favorite moments of Endgame. I mean, when he picks the hammer up, cool, but when he says Hail Hydra, it's just like, it's perfect. And number one, made Sharon kill Cap. We go back now to the Civil War comic book event where Captain America was killed by Sharon Carter. Yeah, so Crossbones sniped him, Agent 13, who at the time was also Cap's girlfriend, Sharon, she delivered the finishing bullet from a much closer angle. Well, it turns out it wasn't really Sharon who was doing this work. It was the classic brainwashing that made this defeat happen. And it's all kind of thanks to Dr. Faustus as well. See, this causes a whole chain of events. I mean, for starters, Bucky decides he should kill Iron Man, blaming him for the death of Steve Rogers. And then Falcon also also goes after his own lead and then Tony ended up showing Bucky the letter Cap wrote about how he should be the next Captain America and Bucky agrees to take the spot but only if he can operate solo and to think all this came to a climax after Steve's girlfriend was the one to deliver the fatal blow it's just heartbreaking and then when you discover that this is all just a big plan orchestrated by the Red School and you know things start to make sense you're like oh no. Number 10, Stan Lee's ire. Initially, Vision wasn't loved by all at Marvel's offices. In fact, Marvel legend Stan Lee hated the look and the name of the character apparently when he was first created in 1968 by John Buscema and Roy Thomas. 
Apparently, Stan complained to Roy about the choice of color for the android, not liking the look of his bright red appearance, and also felt the name was not a good fit, not strong enough for the character. Today, his appearance has become iconic, and we think nothing of it. But back when he was first created, it wasn't just with comic book characters that his existence was considered controversial. Number 9 death of his first creator. Despite the fact that we often attribute Vision's existence to Ultron, he wasn't the only one involved in his creation process. And no, I'm, I'm not talking about Tony Stark here. Professor Phineas Horton was forcefully recruited by Ultron into helping him create the synthesoid we later came to know as the Vision. Vision, in fact, was originally given the memories of Professor Horton's previous android creation, which brought on the rage of Ultron, who had specifically told Horton to wipe those memories. He's like, you do it or you're dead. And Horton was like, we'll see. Ultron, of course, did kill the professor, though, creating probably one of the first tragic moments in Vision's life to come about. At the time, the synthesoid mourned the life of his creator and swore to get revenge on Ultron. And before we move on to this next spot, just a quick reminder, if you are enjoying this video and you want more like it, talking about Wanda or Vision or both of them together, oh, romantic moments, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. It really does help us out on the channel. Number eight, no sense of normalcy. Despite the fact that he might seem cold and seems to embrace his synthetic nature, Vision actually constantly strives to fit in. When Wanda and Vision first got married in the comics, they both sought to find normalcy together by settling down in a suburban neighborhood. Neighborhood. Oh, it's so nice. Similar to what we've seen the couple attempt in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the Disney Plus show WandaVision. Yeah, if you like WandaVision and you want to sort of read more things that maybe have inspired it, this is a miniseries you're going to want to read. The two of them, however, it seems were never fated to have a normal life, and try as they might, strange events always seemed to disrupt their attempts and lurk around every single corner. For an example of what I'm talking about, you need not look further than the first issue of their miniseries together from the 80s, The Vision and Scarlet Witch. Seriously though, check out this miniseries. On Halloween, a quiet night in quickly turns into something out of a nightmare, ending with a visit from Scarlet Witch is often villainous than father Magneto. So it becomes more of a nightmare, I imagine. Number seven, being controlled. The smallest spoilers ahead for WandaVision, if you know nothing about it, but mostly this part is pretty safe as we'll just be focusing kind of on the premise of the show and what we know of it so far based on what has been implied in the episodes. So it's more of like a, if you know the show, you probably know this. In WandaVision, it's implied that Scarlet Witch, Wanda herself, is in complete control of everything going on in Westview, including Vision's appearance and existence there. After all, as we talked about before, Vision's appearance there likely means that Wanda manipulated him and brought him back to life, possibly even reanimating his lifeless corpse. Yikes. As the show unfolds, Vision becomes more suspicious of his life in Westview and Wanda and her involvement not just in it, but in manipulating it as well with her reality altering powers. Also, I never noticed this before, but Westview's name actually seems to be a reference to the initial of the main characters of the show and the show title itself. Westview, WV, WandaVision, WV. Interesting. Also, it's weird that it took me so long to notice that, but I just noticed it today, so. I was looking for all kinds of other explanations as to what Westview meant. I never thought about like the initials. Number six, William Nasland. He was originally introduced in the comics as the spirit of 76 in Invaders issue 14. William Asland also held Captain America's mantle for a brief moment. This what if comic turned out to be canon. So back after the apparent death of Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes at the end of World War II, the United States approached him to be the new Captain America. The first replacement. Wow, how exciting would that be? So much pressure though. So he had the shield for a brief amount of time. He had done a couple of missions and then he died in action. Yeah, he had to fight off these robots and he ended up in the hands of one of them and was crushed to death. But he went down a hero. He activated a flare device that made the robot inactive and and he also summoned the other members of the All Winners to come to the rescue. So he went out a hero, short but sweet. Number five. William Burnside. William Burnside, who had changed his name to Steve Rogers and even got work done on his face to match the look. He ended up developing another Captain America serum, and he and his buddy Jack tried to be the new Bucky and Cap. So they got enhanced abilities and they took down Red School. They did some pretty good work as a team. The only thing was, a year later, things started to go a little bit south. They started to become paranoid schizophrenics, so the government put them in chirogenic suspension. He went from being Captain America to being the villain, just like that. So William and his Bucky 
Rocky Bard's sidekick, Jack Monroe, both were in custody of Dr. Faustus, who brainwashed William to become the Grand Director, the leader of the hate group called the National Force. Number four, 404, Cap not found. In Captain America issue 404, we see Steve Rogers squaring up against werewolves. Yeah, what a sight to see. You heard me correctly. I said werewolves. The story known as Children of the Night runs from issue 403 to 405. And during this time, Captain America is fighting off Starksboro werewolves. And then when Nightshade tries to inject Wolverine with her wolf serum, his healing factor keeps counteracting him. So Druid mesmerized him with serums too. Then the next issue we see front and center, Cap Wolf. Pretty hard to forget. So now he's a werewolf and he has faint memories of Steve Rogers. So, of course, as you would expect, it's a pretty messy good time. Number three, Civil War. Captain America Civil War was released in 2016, directed by the Russo brothers, and the whole movie, like the comic, is superhero politics. If you're a superhero, you have to register. You can't just be out filming yourself doing super TikToks and then you end up accidentally exploding a school. It's just not gonna fly anymore. And in the movie, it's Wanda Maximoff who kickstarts the Sokovia Accords, forcing Tony to side with the government as he feels responsible for Charles Spencer, among many others' deaths. You know, with all the events that unfold with the Age of Ultron stuff. So Steve wants to protect Bucky this whole time, and of course, freedom throughout the team is encouraged. Now, eventually, due to Baron Zemo's work, he gets Tony in the same room as Steve, and we see footage of a brainwashed Bucky kill Tony's parents. The next 10 minutes are filled with Steve having to fight off Tony in order to save his best friend. And it's truly heartbreaking, and it all ends with Steve sticking the shield in Tony's chest, and as he carries away a broken down Winter Soldier, Tony says to him the shield does not belong to him, it belongs to his father. And that's the last time he sees the shield and Tony Stark, so it all goes downhill for Cap for quite a while after this point. Number two. Stuck in Dimension Z. In the comic storyline, Castaway in Dimension Z, Captain America ends up getting stuck in this land created by Arnim Zola. And he's in there for 12 years. That's some Black Mirror type torture. That's like crazy. So during the 12 years, Steve raised a boy named Ian, who's a kid he rescued from Zola as his own. So the whole thing is that Steve has to return to Earth soon before this implant on his torso that's combined with the virus of Zola's consciousness takes over his mind. Not a great scenario. Also, ouch, that doesn't look too comfortable of a procedure. It's one of the more brutal body injuries and of course the whole being trapped for 12 years element, I mean that just adds to this already horrible nightmare. And finally number one, shot by Sharon Carter. We go back now to the Civil War comic book event where Captain America was killed by his girlfriend Sharon Carter. Yeah, so after Crossbones sniped him, Agent 13, who at the time was Cap's girlfriend, delivered the final bullet from a much, much closer range. Well, it turns out it wasn't Sharon who was doing the work, really. The classic brainwashing made this defeat happen. Dr. Faustus. Okay, this causes a whole chain of events. I mean, for starters, Bucky decides he should then kill Iron Man after this, blaming him for the death of Steve Rogers. And then also, Falcon ends up going after his own lead. He just leaves. And now, Tony ended up showing Bucky the letter Cap wrote about how he should be the next Captain America. And Bucky agrees to take the spot only if he can operate solo. No government no big brother watching, just let me do my job, move out of the way, you guys suck. To think all this came to a climax after Steve's girlfriend was the one to deliver that final blow just adds insult to injury.